recorded on my computer. Okay, let's start over. All right, welcome everybody. This is our, I don't know, third or fourth uh, installment in our Buds Lab workshops. Um, this week we have uh, Julian LaPrince, who's uh, our visiting PhD student from uh, TU Eindhoven, and uh, he's going to give a workshop on uh, all things sort of controlsy related slash modely related. I don't know if that's the right way to introduce this, but um, just like the last workshops, it's going to be very two way in a sense, like two way communication. So please don't you know hesitate to ask questions or um, yeah, like have little philosophical debates and things like that. We have two hours, but usually there's not two hours of content. So it's a lot of time to, to chat, discuss, discuss. So with that, yeah, pass it over to Julian. Thanks. Yeah. Um, thanks everyone for coming. And yeah, as you mentioned today, we'll be talking about model-based control, MC. Um, so this involves two notions, modeling and optimization, which I'll go through in the well in the presentation the control side is uh linked to both of them so it, it, we're going to shift between either modeling zooming into modeling or into optimization um and i have not timed this presentation so I'm, i think it's, it should be around an hour an hour and a half but we'll see we'll see how far we go um but let's start with an overall definition so the aim of optimization or control is to identify the best decisions to be taken in order to improve the performance of a system Right, so it's about decision making and concretely optimi optimizing a system refers to either maximizing or minimizing an a defined function, which we call the objective function. And so modeling is then an essential step prior to the optimization that allows the representation of our physical environment of interest as a mathematical model. So concretely, we start, we define an objective function that we here try to minimize the dysfunction of state variables. This is subject to a couple of constraints. So we have model specific equations um, that, could, that we could define as function of the state variables and could be equal to zero. We have inequality constraints. Uh, that is another type of function that should be superior or equal to zero, for instance. And we have a couple of variables under which, um, well, here we include flow or parameters, but more importantly, decision variables. Decision variables are the free variables that the optimization process is going to be able to toy with to choose what is the best decision bar. What do you mean by like flows? Sorry, flows. The flows um, as well as just an energy flow, for instance. An energy flow could be a variable. That's, that's just an example. But mostly it's parameters and decision variables. But let's start and be quite concrete about it. So let's define the simplest like, model that we can. So we want to minimize um, cost of y. That's our objective function. And we have just an X and a Y variable. So because we want to minimize it, that's just going to push down our Y variable to be as small as possible. We can add constraints to it. So let's say our model is AX equals Y. So this is the line that we have here. And we could add maybe an inequality constraint that here works as a boundary condition to lower bound our X value. And so if we solve this problem quite, quite naturally and simply, uh, we find that the minimum value to, well, the value to minimize our objective function is the uh, decision variable x equals one. So what is optimization? It is finding the best decision variables to a given problem. Let's take a, let's take a step back now, um, and we'll talk a bit about where, where this fits into the analytical value chain. So we have descriptive and diagnostics analytics that we know. Um, they, they work both in terms of they aim to provide insights into the past from data ag aggregation or mining and try to answer questions such as like what past happened. And so this can encapsulate in terms of unsupervised learning, either clustering or rule mining. Um, but if you think in terms of modeling, descriptive modeling or diagnostic modeling could use either white gray box or interpretable black box, because here we're trying to understand a system. So we have to have interpretability for that. Then we have predictive analytics uh, that try to answer the question, what will happen? Uh, they usually aim to emulate energy system performance using statistical models and forecasting approaches and want to predict what the future is going to be like. So this includes supervised learning uh, methods such as regression or classification. And we can use uh, 
well, basically any white, gray, or black box approach, uh, whichever performs best for the given predictive analytics. And then we have pres prescriptive, uh, which aim to provide outputs or decision that indicate how to optimally maximize a system's <coughs> performance. And so this and type of analytics try to answer the questions, uh, what should we do? How can we make this or this outcome happen? And so this is optimization or reinforcement learning, basically. So either what I refer to as a gray or a black box approach. Um, why gray box approach? Does, where would optimization fit as a gray box approach? Um, I skipped that part a little bit where I presented it before, but basically we base optimization from a model, which is a white box model because it has to be defined, but we have decision variables which are free for the solver to decide so that it can minimize or maximize the objective function. So this is why I would put optimization in this kind of this reverse gray box approach. Uh, where it's not the objective is not to capture the dynamics of the system, but to find out what are the optimal decisions to be taken so that it performs best. So how does optimization and modeling those two notions kind of interfere together? Where we obviously have the model part where we try, as I mentioned, to capture the dynamics of our, our environment, either with white, gray, or black box. But the objective here is really to understand what our system is doing. Um, and how, uh, what are the dynamics of the system? So this is, to me, the core of engineering. This is trying to capture and understand our environment uh, and predict it best. And then we have the optimization part, uh, which uh, I've put in here in gray box for model-based control or RL in the black box case, uh, um, which works can work as a decision-making agent um, that's just trying to find what are the best decisions to take in order to um, well, have the system perform best. And so quite like to make some echo with what Matthias presented two weeks ago in RL, we would have the model that would provide observations um, to the optimization agent um, so that it would minimize or maximize the objective function and decide what are the best actions to take. So what are the best decision variables to fix uh, to get the best outcome? But this is how those two notions interact together. Um, when we think about modeling and optimization in general, um, and we have a given problem, um, I think us as, engine as engineers, we'd like to make that problem as optimal, as perfect as possible. Um, we, we, and especially with optimization, because this is quite a model-based approach. And so we have a mathematical model. We can find a global optimal solution, which is the best to take, whatever the case. Um, however, in real life, um, that might be that optimality is, if it costs too much. We have to find, we have to spend so much time to approximate a great model, uh, to find the perfect uh, cost function so that our model behaves the right way. And so the question of scalability is, also comes um, as, well, an important factor to consider when choosing which approach might be best to undertake for this or this uh, part of the system. Maybe we can come back to this discussion once I present a bit more, but. This is more for the high level view. Now let's dive in into the, the building model. So what would a typical simple also building control problem model look like? So what do we want to do when we control a building? We want to minimize the costs and what? Comfort, obviously for the occupant. Um, there could be environmental impacts as well. Uh, what else? Reduce the energy consumption. Reduce the energy consumption, right? So energy consumption. People from getting COVID. It could be that. <laughs> Maintenance related aspect, like which components are more likely to be broken. Right. So reducing costs or maximizing a life expectancy of, yeah, yeah. Right. Let's start with obviously a simple one, but we have what we define as comfort costs and operation costs, basically, of the building here in this case. And we want to minimize those uh, over T, which are the time steps we consider. And H here is what we call the horizon of the problem. So that's the assemble of time steps that we're trying to solve our problem for. <coughs> um, I'll mention here that the superscript D uh, refers to decision variables. So th these are parts of the variables that the problem is gonna be able to adapt um, to get the best outcome possible. So the comfort cost could be superior to the set point temperature of the building minus the measured inside temperature of that building times 
say, a certain cost uh, factor. So notice that here, the decision variable uh, is the temperature of the building. Set point is a given, that's a parameter. The cost that you associate to comfort is up to you to decide, but that's also a fixed parameter, basically. Um, and so that's how we set the, the comfort cost in this case. And the operational cost could be equals to um, the heat input. So U is a flow here. Uh, the heat input times, well, the cost that you associate to basically heating your building. Um, this is a superior or equal um, sign just because we want to focus on heating only. If this was heating and cooling and you don't, you don't consider bandwidth, you could just set this to uh, an equality and that would be fine, right? Now, about the building model. So let's take a very, very simple RC model, um, which I based and I take from the, the notorious reference um, from Bahar Matsen, where this is an RC model. Uh, I think I presented them a couple of times before, but you have interior temperature of your building, you have the ambient uh, conditions, your wall would be the resistance between both those temperature points, and you have the capacity of the building that works as this, that you know, represents the thermal inertia of the building that takes time to heat up. Um, and you're subject to inputs of heat, of course. Uh, so that's the decision variable here. And solar irradiance in this case, because we have this information, but these are just basically parameters. These are, um, well, forecasted values, let's say, of the, of the irradiance. But let's get into the model. So the, this is basically the, this model put into mathematics. So our state uh, is our, inside, our, our building's inside temperature and the difference between two time steps, the variations basically in inside temperature will be equals to the difference in out ambient and building inside temperature, one over RC. We have heat inputs. So this is the decision variable here, the heat input. That's basically the value that the optimization problem is gonna try to adapt to keep our building above a certain set point while minimizing its input because it costs the heat. And this here, um, this is just the input of the solar, um, the solar irradiance, but that's just a parameter, right? So that's, that's a given when you do optimization. The solver can, doesn't adapt this. This is a forecasted value. Sure, there might be some uncertainty to it. The same goes for the ambient temperature, by the way. But these are given. And we have to set boundary conditions. So our heat flow input would be um, positive and maybe bounded by well, the maximum capacity of the heat pump, for instance, that you have. And the comfort costs here, uh, I set them as positive as well, uh, so that this doesn't go to minus infinity. Otherwise, we have a problem that is unbounded. As a general piece of advice, if you're undertaking modeling, I would advise that all your variables, uh, you define them as positive. That's just, that just makes it easier when you do your model that you know that the sign plus or minus is indeed this sign and you, know, you don't get uh, unexpected results. Um, you have to do some initial conditions, of course, that your, your instead point temperature would start at a given uh, time and space. Otherwise, it can start anywhere. And then because it's unbounded, it would just you know, start, I don't know, at 1,000 and let the building decay because it, will, it would always be above the, uh, the set point temperature. Any questions on this? Right, but that's it. With, with these set of equations, we've defined what a typical building control problem might look like. Um, and these are the variables actually. So as I mentioned, you have the heat input signal, the inside temperature, and well, the cost functions variables that we've defined here. Uh, but the main decision variable, as I mentioned, that the algorithm is gonna try and adapt is this heat function right there. So if you want to implement this in Python, quite concretely, you will use the pop package and you would define your LP problem that I'll define a bit later on that, that you will initialize and you would declare your variables. So your heat, your temperature of your building and your comfort costs. You would input the constraints of the, of the system, your building model, the boundary condition and the initial conditions that are present here. So this is done by basically adding um, to the declared LP problem, uh, the inequality, the equality, or the inequality constraints that you have between, well, the declare variables and the input parameters that you have. And you can declare your objective function in a similar way that you simply add as well to your, well, problem at the end. So these constraints will just be added to, well, here, what is called my LP problem, 
And that will make and aggregate them into big matrices, basically, that then the solver is going to try to inverse and solve and iteratively choose uh, what are the best um, set of decisions that it can take. Sorry, what, what, what's the pulp? Pulp is the package. package. Right. Just like you're using Keras for uh, neural networks or we were using Jim before, that's, that's so, one of the package that uses, that allows you to do. It's for this type of application. I guess. Yeah, for linear programming or mixed, mixed integer linear programming, which I'll, cool. I'll define that right after. Okay. But yeah. Now, what would a typical energy hub look like? Um, so the idea of modeling may be an aggregated set of utilities um, to, well, to basically provide electricity and heating to a set of buildings. Um, could be modeled in, this, in the following way. So typical storage units are just an update of the state um, variable, the state of charge of that storage unit, plus the input um, basically flow that you're gonna put it multiplied by an efficiency, that's a parameter, and minus an output flow divided by the discharging efficiency. And you wanna make sure that uh, the output and the input are, the flows are below, well, the charging or discharging capacity, and that your state of charge is also upper bounded by the storage capacity. That's a typical storage unit model. That's simple. A convergent unit here, so that would be what? That would be a boiler, that would be a heat pump. Those are simply conversions between, well, an input flow minus an efficiency that would give you an output flow if you consider those models to be linear. So very, very simple models here. And you would have an energy balance. Um, here you have an electric and a heat balance. So that's represented. Actually, you could fuse those two points here, and that would be this, this nod would be uh, the electric energy balance. And this nod right here is uh, the heat energy balance. So you wanna make sure obviously that when you model energy flows that the sum of the inputs equal the sum of the outputs. It's as easy as that. And the objective function for this system could be for instance, to try and minimize well the electric and gas costs that uh, you can get from the grid, grid input over here so that the system can perform, uh, can perform best. Okay, I'll present some typical objective functions. Um, right now, I've been talking about, about operational costs, so which is basically the sum of, well, let's say here, this is electric consumption times an operational cost. Uh, you can multiply this if you're planning in the future um, by the net present value, NPV. Um, and so that's applied to transform the future operational costs to an equivalent present value. That's if you're planning really ahead in the future. Um, so this is um, defined by the function over here, where tau would be the time horizon. So in life, uh, in lifetime, maybe typically 20 to 25 years, and R would be the interest rate. So that could be what three percent or so, typically. Uh, but you also have investment costs. So capital expenditure, capex. Those are usually typically the sum of well, the cost of, let's say, one utility, if you want to invest in a heat pump, here multiplied by a i of j, and this is uh, an integer variable. So this can be either zero or one. One if you choose, if you, the solver decides to invest in the heat pump, or zero if not. Um, and so this is a decision variable. I forgot to put the little subscript D here, but this is very important. And we'll get into integers variables just a bit after, but that's something that can typically be included in a, an optimal sizing problem. And you could add also maybe penalties to your system, to your objective function. So you can orient the behavior of it in, well, the way that you see, uh, you see fit. You could have thermal comfort penalties, as we've just seen. We could have, have ramping penalties if you want to uh, avoid, let's say, that the energy that you pull from the grid is spiking up or down. Um, and so you can put a cost uh, maybe to the difference between those two, uh, those two points, or you could define a ramping constraint, not with a cost as an objective function, but uh, actually as a model constraint. So as a strict uh, ramp up or ramp down constraint. So this differentiation between those two implementations uh, is what we call difference between a soft and a hard constraint. On the left-hand side, we, we, we attribute a cost to this ramping constraint. So the solver can still ramp up or down, although there's a cost to it, but it's not infeasible for it to do it. And on the right-hand side, 
you are defined in it that it cannot go strictly above this ramp up or down constraint. So this is the hard constraint. And typically you can have slack variables as well, which is uh, something that you can, that can be a, to, well, that's a notion that you can hear uh, around, uh, that's usually used to uh, relax, what we call relaxing a constraint is making a hard constraint a soft constraint. So you would associate a cost to, well, a certain variable. Um, here, that, that slack variable S, uh, you would associate a cost to it, and you can include this slack variable within, I don't know, a hard constraint here. You could put plus S over here, and that would allow the ramp up hard constraint to be actually a little bit more flexible, and it could ramp up a little bit more given a certain cost. All right. Okay, let's take a step back. And now we're gonna be talking about the different optimization methods that we have. So maybe you've heard of linear programming, mixed integer linear programming, or mixed integer nonlinear programming before. Um, but the main difference between all of them is uh, presented right here. So some are more scalable and like right speed to a uh, compute. Uh, and well, obviously to be closer to the actual behavior and to capture dynamics of your models, of your system, sorry, you, you need more com complex models. Uh, so that's something that linear programming can't really do. Um, mixed integer programming is usually the intermediate solution to not have non-linear uh, programming. Um, and this includes the integer variables that I've just presented earlier. So binary variables, it could be zero or one. Let's talk about these first. Um, by the way, all these three notions, um, their entire lecture is just on them. So I'm just skimming over them right now. And there's a link here for an open MIT course about it. Um, but yeah, that's the full course. Um, just so you know, just know about it. But there's there's people doing very, very smart work in, in all these respective fields. So, so your, your x-axis fidelity of system models is fidelity, that, is that? Is that like complexity or specificate like it would be it would be related to that. So you want to be especially in the um, when the building system or when you want to define cost functions with respect to investments, you would need at least binary variables. Hmm. And sometimes if you have systems that are nonlinear, right, right, um, right, right. You can always make some like usually you want to avoid this right here. So you would try to approximate nonlinearities with uh, a mixed integer but linear programming way. Okay. As much as possible, you want to tend towards here, but this is usually where where you're going to aim. This is a this is a good slide. I want, I've been trying to find a good point to kind of mm -hmm. interject with a, like a philosophical debate. Before I do that, I wanted to get a show of hands. Who here has background in building modeling? I, I mean, I know Mario definitely, right? <laughs> well, not really. I wouldn't be comfortable. That was your entire PhD was modeling homes. Right? Oh, it's kind of weaseling around doing that. Okay. <laughs> June? Yeah. Energy Plus? Yeah. Something yeah. like that? Martine? Okay. Energy Plus? CEA? Anything else? Nothing much more complex than that. <laughs> Everybody's so Swiss over here. Everybody's okay. downplaying yeah. their years of experience. <laughs> I, sorry, and I didn't enter. I don't know if anybody's met, if, if everybody's met Aikichi. Uh, Aikichi, you want to just give a 10 second introduction by <laughs> yourself? Sorry, I, just, <laughs> I realize maybe people here don't know you. Okay, I, I'm Aikichi, and the third year PhD student. And now I'm PhD candidate recently. And uh, I'm studying about the like occupant centric uh, zoning design in the activity based work space. And do you have building, modeling, yeah. simulation? Yes. What, what tools? Videos. No. And now I'm using Energy Plus. Energy Plus. Okay. Okay. Energy Plus. Miguel, of course. Yeah. All kinds of modeling, not just buildings. Energy Plus. Yeah. You yeah. model like yeah. districts and cities yeah. and CFD. Yeah. Well, CFD. Okay. Okay, Filippo, any modeling experience? Yes, but mostly on the pr practical side of, of the building. Let's see that we don't use directly Energy Plus, but simplified version that are able to give like um, an output that 
you can use for the construction company, something like that. Is you guys build your own models, or okay, okay, start from the scratch, okay, and redo what we did in Revit, okay, but with thermolog thermos. These are like simplified version of Energy Blast. Let's say got it. That are not able to do all the calculation that Energy Blast is able to do, but they give like an output that is um, required from the Italian regulation at least. Let's say got it. Okay. Matthias, yeah, we, yeah. We've, actively, we've actively avoided uh, building systems modeling. You just want eating just uh, BIM stuff, I guess, from undergrad, right? Yeah, but I know design builder, but design builder is quite different from energy plus. Right, right. It runs on energy plus, right? Right. Yes. right. It, anybody online who wants to share any modeling experiences that they have? Oh, well, I, I can share experiences, but I'm not an expert. I think I'm, I'm, I would be much more comfortable going into computer vision, AI, all that kind of stuff than building modeling. The, I feel like there's not, the resources are like opaque, some like old and still the most recent. And there's like, it's the, people seem a bit secretive. Uh, and uh, there's just there's no there's no open source spirit in in that domain, and all tools kind of suck. Or what about CA? Yeah, that's amazing in open source. Yeah, but that's more on the urban scale, right? <laughs> it's just like a collection. And even things. even the standards suck. They're like difficult to read on just everything. Okay, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> there we go. <got> <laughs> we'll come we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Uh, anybody, anybody online who wants, who has experience with building systems modeling? Santa, I think you're kind of new to, newer to the field. Pierre is also kind of new to the field. Uh, mm, I, sorry, yeah, I didn't have really any experience in that field, but yeah, yeah, okay. uh, I understand uh, what's the ins and outs. Right? Okay, okay. And Jintong, do you have experience in building systems modeling or? It, it's okay if you don't. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with this. Okay. No worries, no worries. Okay, the reason I stopped everything just to see kind of everyone's backgrounds because I think that there's a, there's a discussion to be had about modeling complexity, right? And I think that now you're getting into the point where you're talking about optimization mm -hmm. and the different complexities of, of optimization that reflect the complexities of your models. Um, I was trained as a mechanical engineer. So coming out of college, I went straight into like building energy plus style models, right? What you're showing and presenting is like the, the, like like starting from scratch, like like what you guys do, what I think CEA did. Mario, I think also kind of did this in his PhD or went in this direction is like, the energy plus, that just sounds like a lot of work. I don't, you know what? I want to start with the fundamentals and I want to model stuff using equation, you know, using math basically, using the physics and things that I can represent. And so I, these are the two types of people that I think I've seen in the building industry in both research, well, mostly in the research community. In practice, it's very hard to find somebody that would start at this, like at the theoretical level. But the, but the thing I wanna pose maybe to Julian and to the others that have that experience is how, where, when do you decide what approach to take? when you're modeling buildings. So I can tell you some people, their gut reaction, bust out design builder and build a model, right? Busted out, built like energy plus, created a really complex energy plus model. But energy plus models are way more complex, right? And what you're showing is starting at the fundamental level of representing the physics of a building in a, in a much more simplified way which is easier to understand at the level, you know, at the higher level in a sense. But 
you're not representing, like you were just saying, like you have, sometimes you have a building that has like special systems or, you know, there's, you know, that type of thing. So I guess the question, and maybe this is an open question for the whole, the whole like rest of this, this workshop is how does one decide what level of complexity to build into the, the process? And you showed two, you showed kind of two examples. You showed an example of a simple building and then you showed an example of like a small grid scale optimization, right? Which is still very simple, actually. Still relatively simple, right? No, that's the simplest you can which, which is which is which is which is cool. And I and I think, I don't know, I mean like Martine being on the CEA team for however many years, most of the time of CEA, is everyone familiar with CEA? City energy analysts. Have you heard of it, Julian? Or okay. So it's it's like it's like you said, it's just same thing as that as your usual RC model, but just many because it's very it's meant for urban scale. So the energy demand model is very lightweight. It's just three resistance, one capacitive model, everywhere all over the place, single thermal zone, very simplified density modeling, hundreds of buildings at a time rather than one building to a level of precision of ventilation rate. Well, ventilation rates are in there, but like filtration rates. And, yeah, um, yeah. Very specific operation parameters are not in the account for. Very specific geometries are not in the account for. So, so like when you, okay, so let's continue. I mean, I, I just wanted to throw that wrench in there so that we can think about it, maybe discuss it a bit as we go through. But then, yeah, this is in this, your model, and maybe this is a question, I guess. At this point as well, you have different levels of, of optimization capability, but the, there's a trade-off, right? With the, with the capability of the optimization, you're you're it's long, it's longer, it's harder, it's more computation, that type of thing. Does your model set the stage for the optimization complexity? Uh, usually, is that is that like a pretty? That's why they're intertwined here. So, right. okay, here we're talking about optimization methods because they're quite different depending on. If you have integer variables, if you have convexity or non-convexity, there's there's two more slides where I actually present LP okay. and MLP, and so then you have the idea of what is a convex or non-convex problem and how the the approaches differ in terms of optimization. Right. But yes, your model definitely sets the stage for the optimization. And so if you have a super accurate model, but that is non-convex, then you're going to have a very hard time to get a decision that's optimal. Right. Right. Or you, there's trade-offs you need to take. Scale is also an issue, but that, I think we covered that with the notion of uh, if you're looking at a city, it doesn't make sense, or maybe it does, but mm -hmm. if you look at per building uh, modeling, so you want to aggregate things. So depending on the problem, you're definitely going to want to orient yourself with the type of modeling or an approach or another that is as coarse or as fine as necessary, but as simple as possible. Um, but let's talk about linear programming then, so that at least that's yeah. uh, defined here. But formally, linear programming refers to optimizing a problem where the objective function is linear. And so each constraint in it would be a linear inequality or equality. Um, so this is the sets that we would have here, right? So you would have an aggregation of AX here, X being your, uh, your decision variables, by the way, your state, uh, AX equals B and CX superior or equal to D. Uh, with stack being lower and or an upper bound is the generic formulation of any linear problem. So th this encapsulates any any other formulations. And so the stacking of linear con constraints thankfully produces convex problems, which are very simple to, to solve because uh, given a defined state space, state space is the region of, it's basically this state space. State space defines a region where X is between uh, it's lower and upper bound and where these constraints are satisfied. And so within this state space, uh, you want to you, you want to minimize the objective function and you know you will converge to an op when you find a convergent point, it is the global optimal solution because there is only one minimal or maximal point in a convex problem. So that's great news. And here is typically a non-convex problem where you would have well local minimums, local maximums, mm -hmm. and uh, when you have non-convex problems, usually the solvers have to cut it in different pieces, uh, and then comes trade-offs um, when you're into the control field, if ever you're there. Um, you would think, all right, 
you can either approach the problem quite heuristically and set up a bunch of different initial conditions and you would end up either here, either here, or maybe over here. Um, and then you would compare those um, local solutions and just pick the best one. You don't know if it's the global optimum, but that's, let's say, one trade-off to find a solution that's as close as possible to what we think might be the global optimal solution. But to find and to, to optimally converge to what is the global solution in a non-convex problem takes a lot of time and effort. This is one of the reasons why we want to stick to convex problems. Then we have mixed integer linear programming. So it's still convex problems, but because with mixed integer linear programming, um, there might, because we have the inclusion, sorry, of binary variables, uh, there are no local derivatives for integer variables because they're either zero or one. They're not continuous variables. So because there's these breaks in the state space, um, uh, the, so the standard RP metals only work when these discrete variables are assumed known. And so the, the, the approaches to define it are a bit different. So the way to formally define this is then you would define your objective functions by continuous variables and also discrete uh, or integer variables. Um, one news is that if you have discrete variables, any, any given problem with a set of discrete variables can be transformed to a binary mixed integer linear programming problem. Um, so that simplifies a bit the, uh, like the formalization of these problems. Um, and you, so you define Y to just not be only a discrete system, but to be only zero or one. And taking off this example, actually from Wikipedia, it's a great way to illustrate MILP in practice. So if you have this set of equations that describe your problem and you wanna maximize Y here, that gives you the blue lines in the continuous domain. Um, and so if you, if you solve this problem, this will be the linear, so the linear programming optimal solution. However, the state space in a discrete uh, domain is here, uh, well, represented with the red points. And so if you, one of the techniques would be, that would be to, um, uh, to, to round up uh, this, um, well, this found optimal solution would give actually a point that is outside of the state space. And so that's infeasible for this problem. So that's, that's just to illustrate that, that that's why with this approach is um, relying on, let's say a relaxation of the problem um, is one of the ways that this is done because you would, you would find a solution that might be as close, as close to um, the defined state space. But here in this case, within this three type domains, you have two optimal solutions. You have uh, one or two for X actually. Um, Right, so to the way mixed integer linear programming works is that it solves all the possible LPs, so linear programming problems, by fixing the values of the binary variables. And then with the system of branching uh, and bounding, they construct sequences of simpler subproblems that then uh, they solve, and their solution will converge to the original um, MLP problem. That's just to give you a little bit hint about how this is done. But once again, this is a full course in a full field, so let's not dive in too much about this on this. Um, now that these notions have been introduced, I can present more advanced formulations that here introduce the notions that they're binary variables. Typically, uh, in energy systems, you would have part load constraints. So maybe a conversion technology cannot produce below a given power level. So you would have your uh, energy output from that convergent technology, which has to be between a minimum and a maximum, but can also be zero, right? So you have this jump here in the state space that you have to model. Uh, I'm gonna make this participative here. How would you think you could model this with math? You know, you have an integer variable that could be zero or one, and you wanna say, so intuitively you would say, right, this is between, uh, e min and e max, right? So you lower and you upper bound it. But how do you account for this point over here? Any ideas? I don't know. Anybody know? This is what modeling is. You you have something and you're trying to think. Uh, how can I mathematically describe this? Oh, I just give you binary variables. So um, maybe. 
I'm going to use the whiteboard. That's okay. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. I don't know how that's going to be okay for yeah. the following there, but you have this is a parameter, right? Your minimum energy output. And you say your decision particle has to be bounded between um, those two. Yeah. So this is parameter. These are parameters. This is a decision variable. But then you want this to be all equal to zero, but this is above zero. So how do you reach a zero point? Um, within modeling, if you multiply two decision variables together, here if I multiply this by uh, a binary variable e, this gives a non-linear problem actually. So that's what we want to avoid in Delta. You want to always multiply the decision variable to a parameter or a binary to a parameter. If you multiply two decision variables together in your model, that's where you have no linearity because if one moves up, then the other, the you know, the, the state space is uh, is not basically not linear. Well, if I multiply this by a binary here and a binary that you could call, you know, uh, off on, this solves the problem, right? If I don't crashed on my computer. <laughs> All right. yeah. uh, typically, also, we have investment costs. So when you want to size an energy utility and you want to invest in a heat pump, for instance, mm -hmm. well, you cannot invest in it and it's zero, but maybe if you approximate your cost function, this being, let's say, your maximum capacity of your heat pump, and the bigger the heat pump you want, the more it's going to cost you. You see here it's the same. You have a jump between uh, those two states. So that gets solved in the same way possible. You would say your investment costs are equals to, well, the sizing of your, so this is a decision variable, your E max uh, times by the cost of investment. But then this plus B that we have here is then multiplied by an integer, the investment integer, okay? Maximum actualization constraints. So when you have frequent startups and shutdowns of certain te technologies, um, aka batteries, for instance, that can be damaging if they have a lot of on and off charging or discharging cycles, for instance. So you want to sometimes you need to limit the number of starts up and down in a given period of time. I'm not going to ask you to do this because this is a bit more complex, but here you need to define um, two different binaries. One that is uh, that is defined when the system is on and a binary on off. It basically is the difference between uh, those two ones. Um, and so this tells you when there is a switch between on and off. And so the sum basically over the horizon of these switches, you can upper bound it by the maximum number of shots on and off that you would like to have. However, in programming, uh, if you have because this actually this on off value here um, goes from zero no change to shutdown minus one to start of plus one. Um, having absolute um, values is not accepted. Well, it's not accepted. It's not it's not linear programming or not mixed integer linear programming if you have uh, absolute values. So you have to model around this and to do that because that's quite an if statement, right? You're saying, well, if this is negative, make it positive. And if this is positive, leave it positive. Those if conditions introduce splits, but yeah, they are non um, nonlinear. So to remodel this, uh, you you just upper upper bound them uh, with uh, the inverse rotation, the inverse um, division, uh, not division, but subscription. So this is a new way to define that your e on off uh, that is. This is indeed zero with uh, no change, and whether you shut down or start up is just one. So this is indeed now the binary bar. Typically, we have relationships um, that you want to model uh, that might be nonlinear. And so then approximating it with a simple uh, linear line is not enough. So you want to perhaps stepwise linearize 
these systems. So approximate nonlinear relationships with piecewise linearization. So let's say that um, we're trying here to model the efficiency of a system, and that's the input energy. This is the output energy. Um, one way to model this um, in a system where perhaps the, uh, the output energy would try to be maximized is simply to upper bound it. Um, you would say that your output energy uh, has to be smaller or equal than the input energy times efficiency one, so times those different um, those different linear linearities. So this is okay. This works in optimization because, as I mentioned, the output energy is going to try to be maximized in most of our systems. So this upper the sets of upper cuts uh, setting those upper boundaries works perfectly fine. Right, so if a variable would be maximized by the optimization, it can be upper bounded and the resulting domain is convex. But what if we have a set of um, piecewise um, here efficiencies that would be in this form? And then if we have a typical problem and we want to minimize the cost, then the solver would still want and try to maximize this output energy here. And so if we implement this set of equation with this type of system, that's the kind of um, line that we're actually going to be solving right here, um, which uh, if both variables are positive, it results to a very, very small space here. So that's not what we're trying to model. But if we lower bound it only, then the variable here is just like going to go to plus infinity. So in this case, to follow these exact lines, we need uh, to can well to for the optimization, we need to um, put these approximations into bins. So we define um, a different sets of bins for the input uh, energy flow, composed of well three zones here: B one, B two, and B three. And the output energy here, E out, will be equal to the sum of those three uh, input bins that we can then put between the minimum and the maximum capacities with those in-between breakpoints multiplied by integer variables. So you see that it becomes a bit more complex when you want to approximate non-linearities, actually in this case, and then you end up with, well, here two, uh, no, actually three integer variables that the solver has to fix. It, to fix. Other typical processes that are a bit more advanced to model, but that I'm not going to get into here for the sake of just time, your own sanity, um, is minimum runtime constant. So if some equipment must run continuously for a minimum amount of time due to the nature of the process. Uh, so if you start up a machine that it can be expected to be functional in the next time step, but needs a couple of time steps to perform, that can be implemented too. Ramping constraints, which we've seen. so. Um, and network layout optimization, where you need to decide which energy lines or node links are optimal to install, for example, for district heating. But these, there, there are particular ways to model this, uh, these systems in uh, a MILP type of framework. And I here sent you a pointer to a course from MPI DTH Zurich, which addresses these uh, more advanced uh, modeling techniques um, that I got uh, most of the inspiration from for this, uh, well, at least these few slides. So that's, a, that's also a full course, right? Now let's talk about optimization again. Um, so far, we've been optimizing costs and uh, comfort, which um, are not so conflicting, but you can, you can deal with, let's say, uh, some optimization problems where you would have conflicting objectives, where the minimization of costs uh, but the minimizations of environmental in, um, environmental impacts uh, will will not you know have the same uh, produce the same outputs. So one solution to minimize the object two different objective functions is uh, the epsilon constraint method, and this minimizes only one objective function while constraining the other by a new epsilon parameter. So you iteratively fix this epsilon parameter to well starting minimum value. And given those different sets, you obtain uh, what we call a Pareto front. 
uh, you've probably heard about this, which is the optimal solutions um, that illustrate the feasible trade-offs between those different objectives. So with this Pareto front, usually that's what you would produce and give to decision makers if you're producing a problem for a community and you're designing a district heating, you're saying, well, this solution right here is the best one for environmental costs, but uh, because it's really low, but it's super expensive for money. So they would rather have a trade-off that's over here usually. Um, and this Pareto front, the definition of this front can, can help for them to decide which, which trade-offs are the best to account for. Um, now, a centralized versus decentralized approach is another topic I'd like to get into. So as problems grow in size or complexity, they can become intractable to solve. And so a proposed solutions uh, can be either first to minimize the number of time intervals considered um, or the consumption generation nodes or cut the, the problem into here smaller parts that are more comp computationally chewable uh, pieces. So the difference between these approaches is that you would go from what is a very large problem that uh, you solve and you get a global solution. So that's the centralized approach. And if it's, this is decentralized, you cut this large problem into different sub-problems um, that you will iteratively solve. So you will solve sub-problem one. You'd get a local optimal for sub-problem one. Uh, then there is some communication between these problems and you would get the local optimization for sub-problem two. And then starting again to the end of the problem, you would converge back and this process would be repeated until we have a global solution convergence. Wait, uh, how do you uh, split it up? Uh, like according to constraints or do you yeah. limit? The... That's the next question. How to best divide a given problem into? <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Are you wow. saying? Someone's following. <laughs> um, right, but even before I get that, let me talk about convergence here. So how do you know that you've converged to the global solution? So you can measure this. The, obviously, the best way, the ideal way is um, to have a proof of concept where you have the large problem, you see that's the optimal solution, and you can check, oh, yeah, we're close. You're pretty close to the optimal solution. But typically, you would have a decaying convergence, although reaching the optimal solution would be unnecessarily long. And so you just want to get pretty close to it, and you're saying, good, we've converged to it. And so you get this, you find this by, let's say, saying, well, the difference between one iteration uh, subjective function results and the next one is uh, within our threshold and our boundary. So we, we say, all right, now the difference is too small. We're not making much progress. This is this, the output that we get. OK, back to Mario's question. How do we best divide a given problem? Um, all right, oh, I have a link here, because that's also a full field how to best divide a problem into like <laughs> stuff problem. That's math and that's, I, I, I would love that, but uh, it's, it's, it can get uh, pretty complex actually. But this is a link to a summer school from DTU actually about data-driven analytics and optimization for energy systems. So that's pretty tailored to what I think we are doing too. Uh, so if you want to check it out, but there's, you know, there's, there's quite some content. So this is a summer school that takes typically a week and pretty hefty in, uh, in content as well. Okay, so let's exemplify distributed optimization with a simplistic building to building energy exchange scenario. You have one building that has a battery. You have another building that has a PV panel. They both have energy demands and they can both pull from the grid. But if they both work together, well, let's say the, the PV produced at some point in time uh, is not as too much for this house. Um, and too much for both of them, let's say, then the battery can store it and that would benefit the whole system, right? So if we solve this as an essentialized approach, well, great. The battery will indeed be used uh, for the extra PV generated and we won't pull energy from the grid. Um, sorry, sorry, just, yeah, I'm going to- That's all right, that's for you then. <laughs> uh, open, then I'll open it up to you guys, but how would you split, how would you devise the problem? into uh, sub problems here. What would be the typical subsystems that we can consider here? There's the, there's the home itself, right? In terms of its demand. Yeah, so let's consider uh, the building here. Uh, it's a nice picture, but this is just an energy demand, right? This is a energy consumption, energy consumption. So that's already, that's already. That's a given, that's already right? Good. That's a parameter that, or a forecasted value that we have. 
like a subsystem can be the battery and the photovoltaic together. That would be the easiest way, I guess, yeah. But then, okay. Um, so when you have a, a problem, this is a very small one, by the way, but ways to divide problems can, can be around usually um, complexifying constraints. Um, if you have constraints of investments, for instance, these are complexifying constraints because if you choose to invest in something or not, that will change the nature of your problem. Um, but usually when we're doing building, um, so neighborhood energy optimization, we split it into building systems. You would say, well, you have building one, this battery belongs actually to building one. Uh, this PV belongs to building two, so let's keep those two separated. But at some point we want those two uh, soft problems to communicate and to converge so that this battery will be used even though this subproblem does not have the information that there's going to be PV generation and another subproblem. Um, let's get into the modeling details just so we know what we're talking about. So this is, this is the simplified model. This is the, the simplest model we can have for this, right? A battery is a linear, uh, is here modeled linearly. So update of the state of charge by the previous state of charge times some decay. Uh, plus what's coming in, minus what's coming out, subject to, well, a maximum value. And then the energy balance is basically this node right here. You're basically saying that the storage out, uh, what's coming out of storage, plus what's coming in from the grid, plus what's generated by solar should be equal to what's going into the storage and what's going into uh, both of our buildings. And we want to minimize the costs on the grid. For the sub-problems then, sub-problem one would then be um, actually, these are both, um, well, then we have two nodes, basically, subproblem one being this. So this is the battery node, and you're saying, um, oh, I mixed them up, right? Well, I put the battery in the wrong subproblem, never mind for this. But basically, you're saying, this is, let's say this is subproblem one, you have the battery here. But then that would be uh, this node right here, uh, where it's, what's going into the node, so the energy coming in here, plus what's generated by the solar, um, plus you building two, uh, so that's the demand of the building, plus what's going out of this node, because you need to have communication with this node. So this, 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 these two equations here should be up here, apologies for that. Um, and you have this node right here that they both, that's the, this line here is the same constraint um, but that's the point that uh, allows those two systems to communicate. When subproblem sub one is trying to be solved, it's, it's going to try to say, right, so we have a U demand from the building. Um, so let's try to, well, basically minimize U node in, so the input energy going into this node uh, so that it can meet the demand of that building. And so this energy balance right here, which is this point, is going to say, well, node N1 is my decision variable. What's going um, from node uh, 2 to node, I mean, what's going out of node 1, basically, but to node 2, this is a parameter. What's going in and out of this node is just, it's fixed. It doesn't know. So it's only trying to optimize its, its own values right there. And so the, and that's the grid input. So the grid input would then be just equal to the sum of what's going to be split into subproblem one and subproblem two. But for subproblem one, what's going to subproblem two, he can't affect it. So that's just fixed to zero for this problem, then subproblem one is solved. And when we reach subproblem two, it's going to optimize this. But um, here, U node one will be equal to the decisions taken by subproblem one. Right. So this will be updated by something that's fixed. But when we come back to subproblem one, well, because there's solar right here, maybe actually what's coming out of the node here will be updated. This might have actually some output electricity um, that was not available before. And so then it can use this information to store it in the grid and update its decisions. And so usually with a couple of iterations, we reach convergence. I forgot to mention that's the objective function there. Um, you could solve this problem with the objective function that both subproblems will try to minimize the demand for just their respective nodes. Or you could solve this problems when they try and minimize the overall 
grid um, and well, grid energy that they're going to consume. Do you know what the difference is between those two different type of objective functions? Does anyone, does anyone have a hint? Because this is basically a multi-agent system, right? You have agent one building one and agent two of building two. They both have different kind of environments. And you're saying they could behave like this, try to solve this problem, or they could behave like this. So the difference between the decentralized and centralized? The, both are decentralized, actually. Oh, okay. But they're just, they don't share the same objectives, right? This one is just trying to minimize its local demand. It doesn't care about um, the overall grid, because U grid actually adds, adds up U node one and U node two. So <clears throat> here they share some interest, actually. So the difference is between individualistic behavior and cooperative behavior. So here, we dive a bit into the field of multi-agent system and um, competitive versus cooperative uh, uh, behaviors where they exchange some information between one agent or the other. This relates to game theory, and this is another full field that there are entire courses about. Wait, you're going to teach us all that? I am not. I'm just showing you that, look, <laughs> this is beautiful mind. a little bit what you can do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's the basis of game theory. Um, very interesting stuff, um, but yeah, we're not going to dive into it right here. Um, so let's talk about uncertainty as well. We're reaching till the end on this. There's 23, 24 slides, so bear with me. Uh, just a couple of more notions. So as optimization, optimization relies on prediction, right? Because you want to take best decisions for the future. So there's always uncertainty. That's an important factor to take into account and how that might affect the outcome of the optimization, for instance. So typically, and then to account for uncertainty and optimization, you would vary uh, certain input parameters and test how that impacts the, um, well, the optimization as a whole. So that is uncertainty analysis, which tried to answer the questions where how is the output of the optimization affected by uh, uncertain input parameters? And then you have notions of global sensitivity analysis, which rely on the similar approach, but try to answer the questions that what are the most important input parameters that are driving the variations of the optimal solution? And so that's the difference between a first for uncertainty analysis and a total order suball index, where here you're just trying to see how one parameter might be affected the output and how a different set and combinations of output might uh, affect each other. I'm going to make some links with machine learning here. Um, this relates to Shap values, for instance, Shapley values for that try to account for how one feature might impact uh, the output of a neural network. This is very similar here for optimization. Uh, and the global sensitivity analysis also accounts for, well, sure, you have a lot of different parameters and you're just varying one, but because all the other parameters are set, um, there's also intercorrelations between them. And so that accounts for that. Um, also within with this, this total order suball sub index. But accounts for parameter interactions, yes, to what you have. Um, we have also stochastic optimization, which identifies the probabilistic best solutions, but that requires probabilistic descriptions of uncertainty. And that is a whole new stage of optimization that is called two-stage stochastic programming. So that's no longer linear programming or mixed integer linear programming. That's, that's a different field. Here you try to minimize investment costs with expected operational costs. So you need to have statistical description of your systems to perform. Again, that's an entire course. Like all these topics, uncertainty and optimization is not just an entire course, but it's, yeah, it's, it's research of its own, uh, which is of course very important. And then you have robust optimization. This does not require, this has the advantage of not requiring probabilistic descriptions of uncertainty. Um, but it uses intervals, um, let's say, of uncertainty um, for, well, the uncertain parameters and seeks optimal solutions given worst case scenarios. So this can be similar to the prisoner's dilemma, but with only one agent. You're saying, well, this might happen, this might happen, this might happen. What's the worst that can happen? And what's the best I can do in the worst that happens such that I'm minimizing my risks? That's robust optimization. Not necessarily optimal, but it's optimal with respect to the worst outcome. So that's necessarily if you need something that's stable, you, right? You don't want to take much risk. You, you don't want your grid to crash. You do robust optimization. 
And then once you get, let's get a bit now into control. We've been dealing with optimization. And so far we've been considering a fixed horizon, right? From time step zero to, I don't know, one year. You're saying you want to design your best system and control it for a year and say, for a typical year, what should be the size of my uh, heat pump? Uh, what should be the size of my battery so that the whole system performs uh, well as you see fit and you minimize the cost, let's say. And control, um, to account for the or, or constant uncertainty, uh, you want to solve the problem with successive planning horizons. So smaller horizons H that each present a small part of the total time frame. So each planning time step will be implemented uh, we will implement the chosen policy and update the predicted forecast of the next iteration. This is how MPC works, small predictive control. At, at the first iteration, you have a horizon, let's say, of three time steps. And that's the prediction you have because you can't look more ahead than, I don't know, three hours, let's say, where you have accurate um, predictions. And so you're going to make decisions, irrevocable planning decisions for the next time step. And that's the predicted decisions that you're going to take for the next one. Then in the next iteration, in the next hour per se, you would have new forecasted value. So that might have changed a little bit. And so you still keep planning a longer horizon of three, well, here time steps, and you implement, um, well, the, just the step ahead decisions that you've taken. So this horizon allows the solver to have a bit of information on what's gonna happen in the future, take just the, the best decision it can for the next step ahead, and then keep updating its values as the horizon keeps progressing over time. So this, the advantage of this approach is that, well, we divide the problem into smaller stock problems. We account for uncertainty with changeable planning periods. However, this can cause problems for long-term decision-making. When we want to account for um, decisions that might have an impact that are far beyond the, like, the horizon that we're considering. For example, seasonal storage scheduling. And so this is where I'm going to link up a bit with what we've seen last, week, uh, last workshop as well. How do we see beyond the control horizon? Well, the value function, the Bellman value function, can come in handy for that. So approximating the Bellman value function will inform the controller on the impact of its present decisions on the future. Just for the sake of definition, the value function, uh, the optimal value of a control problem is the opt sorry, the value function is the optimal value of a control problem function of an initial state x. Your function would be you would try to minimize the loss of or the considered horizon that you have, plus the value function um, of the decisions that you're going to take by the end of that horizon. And this value function here will tell you what are the costs of taking those decisions for the end of that horizon and consider them as new initial. Uh, variables. Does that make sense for you? We're saying, let's take maybe an, an example. I'm going back to this illustration here of the energy hub. Uh, so this is actually work I did for my master's thesis. You have an energy hub, you have a demand in electricity and heating, uh, and you have long-term storage um, that has the advantage that it does not suffer from short-term decay, like the batteries, but is, as it's saying, well adapted for seasonal storage, and you have short-term storage. So if you optimize this system by knowing exactly what's going to happen in a year, this is a bit how your battery storage would be scheduled, and this is how the long-term seasonal storage would be typically scheduled. You would produce additional photovoltaic energy in the summer, you would store it and try and, to, and, well, and then use it for heating to produce um, with the heat pump here um, to produce heating for the winter. But controlling this problem, the seasonal storage problem with MPC, causes a problem because you only have a horizon of what, maybe two weeks tops. And so if you give this problem to be solved to an MPC solver, the seasonal storage will barely be used because it will try by the end of the horizon to have that state of charge be brought to zero. There's no value for, the, for a short-term control to store energy because if by the end of the horizon, there's energy in the storage that's not been used, then it's a waste of energy and it's not optimizing the function as it should. The problem here indeed is the control of this integer storage in MPC, but the challenge comes in evaluating the exact shape of this value function because this explodes. Um, this is called the curse of dimensionality because this would require 
uh, this Bellman value function to be evaluated for every state of charge of the seasonal storage in every time step of the considered problem. So for a typical year, you would have to solve, well, 8,600. So let's say it's per hour problem. So 8,000 and plus time steps where you would need different point in times to approximate the value, the costs of, of what a state of charge of that seasonal storage state would be, which is intractable. And so that's a bit what I wanted to, for you to, to try and understand. What I like about this problem is that um, we're considering the Bellman value function, but associated to a single state, which is here, the seasonal storage state of charge. So it's a little bit more easy to understand. And I'll go back to the board for this. Um, if this is your horizon, this is a typical year, and this is the horizon of your MPC solver, and this is your state of charge of your seasonal storage, the MPC solver will probably do something like this, right? It's going to say, well, by the end of my horizon, I don't need to store it. And if you have the full year, then you would get a, a nice use of your seasonal storage. Mm -hmm. The value function gives the information that actually storing this much energy will result in this much cost. So actually, it's more interesting to store over here um, because over here, uh, I'm giving information basically on the state of charge about this, the full scale of the, of the system. The value function looks at something a bit more like this. Here, this is the state of charge, and this is here the value function, function of the state of charge. But this is for one point in time. This is, this is only for one point in time, and it's going to look at something a bit, a bit like this, usually. It's saying, um, well, if, 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 it's at, if it's at zero, that, that will cost us a lot because we're not going to use this seasonal storage for the rest of the year and we need it. So there's a high cost usually there. And if you store it, um, if you store a lot, then, well, your cost will be smaller. But then obviously the solver here, the MPC is trying to do a trade-off between long-term storage and short-term storage with a battery that is more efficient, right? So the, the challenges then value function approximation is trying to define, well, how many... How many cuts do we need to sort of like approximate this value function um, and over every time step of the considered problem? And that's it. Um, yeah, so this is just an exemplification of this. And just for your, for your curiosity, this on some results. So this is what I've just shown on the board. This is the value function uh, here represented by the well, in function of the seasonal state of charge that's here been approximated and there's a lot of different techniques to do that. And you can see different control strategies results uh, where you, well, constrain or not the MPC solver to different approximation techniques of the value function and with boundary or no boundary constraints. But I'm not gonna get into too much details of that. That was really just to, so that you have a bit of an idea of what that, um, that value function serves for with MPC for the long-term impact of things. Right, thank you, for, thank you for that. We can open up with discussions or questions uh, or go back to more philosophical discussions now about the help, the inner I, I, and such. I have some philosophical things to talk about. I don't know if anybody else wants to ask questions though. Akishi, what do you think? <laughs> I'm oh, yeah, so I, I, I don't know much about MPC, but any limitation of the like, how long the time horizon is? Oh, no, that's up to the forecast, basically, right? Because any optimization problem is usually based on forecasts. And so that's how, you know, how accurate can your forecast be and for how long, what you want to account for. Um, but there's different things, right? I mean, MPC is control oriented. So you're saying you have a system that is fixed and how can you best optimize its performance while it's fixed? And as we've seen with the value functions, there are problems that are of sizing and you're trying to say, well, what would be the optimal setting of this system actually? Could it be, could it be optimized? Could we set things up differently? And so that's, um, for that, you usually use historical data and try to get a typical year or a typical set of conditions to try and optimize it. In the best way possible. 
So then it's not a forecast, but you, you do need to take some assumptions on yeah. what so, would the future be typically like. So theoretically, can uh, MPC can uh, predict the so long, longer uh, horizon, like seasonal problem, but so MPC can control. Um, you know, the, as I've shown, with but that, that requires value approximation of the value function. If you want to use MPC, it's for that. If you have deterministic optimization where you you have a full year of data, then you can you know optimize that, and you would get the best behavior for that year. But then, realistically, when you control day to day your operation of your system, you need to associate a cost for it to yeah have information about the long term impact of that. Does that answer your question? Sorry. Can, can I ask you? Go for it. If you want to apply this kind of approach, like let's say to um, understand which kind of system is best for, let's say, a building. I mean, you show that the, the main point were more or less fixed. So you had like an IP, an IP pump or an electricity, and you managed to, let's say, um, model every, every instance in, in a mathematical way. Is it possible to not know which is the instance <clears throat> you need, but um, let's say consider different types of instances and see which one is the is the best for let's say building? Because very often we have like the problem. Okay, we should use an heat pump, or is best is better to use like I don't know um, a chiller with yeah. a, another kind of. Uh, yeah. That's typically uh, optimal sizing a problem, and so that's that's the that's when you consider capex, capital investment costs, and operational costs at the same time. Typically, you would try to solve the problem given all the different possibilities that you mentioned, but you have to have models for them. You have to have a model for your heat pump, a model for your chiller, um, and you're saying to the solver with an integer variables related to the investment costs, do you want to consider it? If you can, uh, you, if you if you do, then that will cost you this much and for this size. And well, given the, let's say the typical year that you're giving it um, for the system to operate, it will tell you, well, uh, it makes more sense for me to invest in a chiller and uh, actually a small heat pump because we need it in the winter too. Um, and that's so, and by this size as well. So that's a sizing problem. Okay, and you can, can go, um, let's say, up to the, the very, let's say, if you model a building, okay, a real building, and you try to model how the system really works. Let's say so all the air terminals, all, all the um, plugs, all this kind of stuff. Can you apply like a model for forecast which is the best system option? Is is it theoretically possible? You can, yeah. At what cost? But you can. Yeah, that's the question we've been asking. It's like it's going to take a lot of time to get mathematical descriptions of one like perfect case. But I guess for your digital for quin twin case that makes sense to that's where you want to go to like that level of precision but yeah definitely yeah thank you i have a hands-on part as well that i haven't gotten to right now but i wanted to open up for questions first before we get into that well i have i mean this is let's spend like five maybe ten minutes yeah because i want to i want to talk about like so what you've shown today and you and you said it i don't know if 10 or 12 times like there's this is a whole field mm. <laughs> right like there here's a concept this is like a whole uh you know course or week-long workshop or whatever and so what you're showing what you showed is i think a lot of um tools like you it's almost like you have a toolkit and you're like okay here's tool a b c you use tool a pretty much all the time tool b is what you use in certain situations where you have these these things and so the question i have is like is it so deciding which tool to use is a bit of an art, right? It's a bit of like an experience based thing where you look at a problem and you say, okay, I think I'm going to need these tools. You implement, you, you use those tools. And then you think, well, you know what? This isn't what I, this isn't the results I expected. Actually, there's a phenomena that I'm not accounting for. Oh, I need to do this. Da, da, da. So is that, is that, is that the right, the right way to characterize it in a sense? Or is it, could be. Possible. Is there like a guidebook that says like, okay, here's your problem you're trying to solve. Pick this. Does your problem have these attributes? Yes. Okay, pick that. You know, is it, 
is it kind of structured that is there like a course there is no like generic modeling course at that there level. is there is i mean uh, there, there is yeah. Okay. The modeling and optimization, which yeah, so aggregates the data. Introduction, okay. But I, I, I took some like deeper tangents that could go a bit beyond that with distribution, with uncertainty, and so on, just to show right. you like the options. But just if you if you're just looking at modeling and optimization, that's you can just say that's one course, and then it's the question of right how you know. What kind of what is it that you want to do, um, and right. at what speed do you need, you know, your 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 solution to be at? If you're doing planning, it's all right. If you know you, you press run and you wait a couple of weeks, and then you get your optimal solving problem, and it's not an issue. If you're doing control, then you would need probably a result within the five minutes so that you right. could bid uh, your energy and commit to the scheduling and inform this other guy. And um, so, I mean, the reason, the reason I bring this up is because I've over the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years that I've been going to research conferences, it's about 50% of the time that I'm sitting in a research presentation where I'm thinking, okay, everything seems reasonable here. The person chose, I think the right model for this right application, blah, blah, blah. blah. You know, it looks like a, something great. The other 50% of the time I'm like, wow, you spent nine months doing something that you didn't need to spend nine months doing, right? Or on the other hand, you spent one week doing something you probably should have spent nine months doing, right? Like you're creating a really simple model to, to try to answer a question that needs a much more complex model. And so I guess that's what I'm driving towards is like in, let's say the research, cause like in, in let's say research and practice, right? In the practical side, it's not often you have the resources to do anything that's not like, you know, a formulaic in a sense, like here's the tool, here's the application, boom, like that. Yeah. In research and R&D, it's, it's, it, we have the luxury of playing around with ideas, but, but the thing that I, like I said, like, like these 50% of these people who go down these rabbit holes or don't go down the rabbit hole they probably should, like, what could those people have done? I guess had a better advice from people, or maybe it's trial and error where they, they do the because I've seen that too, and I've done that. Everybody in this room's probably done that where you spend <laughs> a month doing something at the end of the month, you're like, Why did I do that? <laughs> like, that was it's not useful, it didn't help me, or something. So, it's I don't know, this is maybe not a question, this is more of a discussion topic. And I don't know if anybody has any stories they want to share. I mean, I, I, in my PhD, I went down the path of learning a bit of optimization to see if that was something that would be interesting or useful. Um, I ended up spending, I don't know, like three months trying to learn Delica. I, I forget what, yeah, like, mm -hmm. something like that, right? And anyway, at the end of those three months, I was like, I'm not using this. <laughs> like, this is like over, I'm over specifying the, the heck out of this model and these type of things. So I don't know if you have any personal experience or maybe that's something, does anybody have any personal experiences about model finding the right tool or I don't know, if, if Julian, if you have. That's definitely an important point. And I think as scientists, it's always important to keep this uh, bird eyed view at the beginning and think, what am I trying to achieve? It's, at some point we get super hyped about the technique or, um, uh, something that's new that's shiny and think oh i want to use that and right. obviously i mean we're, we're we're a bit geeky too so we like the logic behind that so we like we dive deep into something but then neglect the things around which uh you know then you maybe you produce um a work by and then by neglecting the things around it doesn't make much sense in terms of value so it's important to keep that in mind and and think right so if i want to push this technique and go deep in it then you know what are the settings around it that that needs to be accounting for to, to look out for there. So there's no guidebook for that. It's, it's yeah. basically, right? So think about uh, that context first, uh, the white picture, uh, but also I think most of what you refer to makes me think of that quote. I think, is it Albert Einstein or is it someone else that was uh, said, you know, for modeling, you want to make your model as complex as necessary, but as simple right. as possible. Occam's razor or whatever. Yeah, like there, or there's I think it's actually, yeah. Or maybe that, something's, yeah. Um, but that's a general rule of thumb for any approach, I would say. It's just, right, it's at some point, this model is enough to capture what you want it to do. Right. Don't, you 
or is it worth the effort to go into the detail? Is it justified for, um, which is, yeah, it's obviously a function of the application you want to do too. And I guess the literature, I mean, usually your, your literature review would point you in the direction you should be going in, in a sense. Um, but that's not always the case because you can always find a paper that does something that you're like, oh, I want to do that. Mm. That paper is really cool. Oh, there, go in that direction type of thing. So I don't know. I have an important question actually. It's why modeling? Why do you guys do modeling in your everyday in your work? What 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 is it implied for? What do you, you know, why modeling? Because when I I don't know, I've never touched Modelica, I don't want to touch it. And for me, the, the white box models or the energy plus can make sense if you if you don't have anything, if you don't have data and you need something to to try and you know simulate and get a sense of all right, like let's say for the sake of science, this is a measurement point, but it's still a simulation. It's fake. It's not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not measurement point. So I'm data driven. Obviously, this is the focus of my PhD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gray box and black box, but but you, you have to have that your sensors are restricted by resolution. Especially, I'm explaining in terms you know, let's say outdoor and that's life. I mean, that's 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 the yeah. But the world. issue is that you know, urban planners, you know, they want to have a vision of what is happening globally on different points. So especially if you talk, I mean, I'm talking about my field, you know, urban heat mm -hmm. They are not satisfied, you know, by just knowing, you know, let's say the temperature difference only between two points or several points. Mm -hmm. What they want to know is what is happening overall, you know, over the city, a district, a neighbor. It, it is where, you know, modeling, I mean, in my case, in my experience, you know, comes into the game. Which means that, okay, you have sensors that can be useful for my case, and it connects a bit to your topic for calibration, which is also a kind of optimization problem. So basically you collect data, which are used after to measure, you know, the accuracy of your models. But after it, there are two things. First, they want to have some forecast and also to test different strategies, which is something that you cannot really evaluate with only data. So which means let's say, you know, you want to install more trees, you know, like for instance, the pulling a US project. No? Right, so don't say, right. you know, uh, the NUS campus infrastructure, they want to say, they want to plant uh, 100,000 trees. Mm. So how do you measure this with sensors? Of course, you yeah. have to come up with models. Yeah, of course. No, I'm not. This, no, I mean, models, models are useful. I'm just saying. Now you remember once we, like we got a nice, you know, uh, presentation, you know, by someone uh, from uh, uh, Georgia Tech who was saying, you know, that all models are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a famous... Uh, some are useful. All models are wrong. Some are useful. But still, you know, they give you, you know, some indication, you know, what should be the way, you know, to actually to optimize, you know, certain mm. things, you no. Know? So with sensors, you know, they have their own limitations. Actually, this connects also with my topic after because I was interested yeah, to talk about yeah. you know, <laughs> I was model, to talk about you know, measurement. Uh, yeah, more measurements yeah. based, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but yeah. well. I mean, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's it, yeah. So this is to answer your question, you know, at least for my right. field of research, you know. Yeah, it's prescriptive. It's, it's just because, you know, in what terms is. of resolution, you know, somehow data, they provide yeah, information, but with a certain within a certain resolution, while the expect is always to have a broader vision, space or time, you know, resolution. Mm -hmm. Where models, at least in my case, in my research field, you know, are necessary. Well, to, to go back to Julian's question, yeah. um, there's a lot of non function like, is that the right word? I don't know what's the right word. There's a lot of silly reasons why people simulate instead of using data driven methods. And I think, I mean, silly is not the right word either. It's like practice, there's a lot of practicality behind it too. If I, the funding agency really likes Energy Plus, so let me write a grant that uses energy plus, yeah. right? I, I mean, my PhD, I was a part of a project that was not by, not really by choice, but uh, here's a bunch of modeling programs. Let's see if we can couple all of them. Let's couple every modeling software we can find and get them all to run at every timestamp, you know, concurrently. And that was the goal of the whole project and it was funded. So guess what? That's what we had to do, right? So what's the point? And then, oh, that's the whole time. What, what, what's the point guys? I don't care. It doesn't matter. I mean, we have a colleague, <laughs> our friend Darren at the ETH, who I think the guy who wrote the Reddit Python shell plugin, actually, Darren, Darren Thomas. 
you know, he, he, he's like, come on, guys, we just have to finish this. We were kept asking, like, why are we doing this? This is the most ridiculous thing ever. Anyway, so, it's, so sometimes it's like using tools because for the sake of using them, um, you don't have data. You don't have data at all. You can't find data. It's just hard to get. And, and very expensive. And you're a scientist. You don't want to spend time calling people. <clears throat> How do I get, oh, can I use your data? Yeah, sure. Uh, but no, we can't use it because of privacy problems. Well, I don't want to deal with that. But Getting approvals. <laughs> let, me, let me just simulate some of my own synthetic data, right? And so I think this is a philosophical discussion. And, and one of my, like, uh, idols in terms of research is uh, Eamon Co, who's a time series guy uh, that I've, based a lot of my PhD on, and he says, like, don't use synthetic data for anything. Like, it's ridiculous. Like, take a, he has this, you know, instead of, you know, glue little sensors to the back of a, of a cricket, don't just, like, make data in that sense. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a trade-off. And then you find a lot of people that say, well, measured data, yeah, measured data is not perfect. You can't extrapolate. It's, it's, it's flawed. It's too small. It's, you know, it's not, uh, yeah, you can't put, uh, it's, there's a lot of uncertainty in how it's collected and the accuracy of the sensors. I mean, that's the, a lot of simulation people, that's, that's the number one thing that I get is like, well, how do you know the data is good? How do you know it's like, mm -hmm. how do you know it's accurate? How do you know it's quote unquote good? Well, what is good data? Anyway? How did you get them all in the first place then? Like, right. like if your sensor is on that wall and it's super duper accurate, is that any better than having it like here where we're sitting and be less accurate, right? Like there's this, I mean, is it useful? That's the question. I think it's the same thing with models. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, that's a philosophical wrench that I want to throw in there. Let's get to your practical hands-on example. If we run out of time, you might just like set us, set us in the direction. No, it's going to be like 10 minutes. Oh, perfect. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think I have a break. Yeah. No problem. Then have a little break. Perfect. Okay. This is the GitHub link, right? Um, so the for the MC workshop. So if you to fork this to your own uh, repo, you would then get actually. Um, so there's just a simple uh, input data from a, a building from actually from GTU uh, that they use for RC modeling as an example. And we're going to get into the so the code right here. This is not I'm sorry, a Jupyter notebook, but it's just to give you a little bit of a, of a view. Uh, you just need pandas, mylib, and pulp. Pulp is where we do the optimization. There's all other optimization uh, packages out there. There's Pymo. Um, they, you know, there are a lot of different things. Pulp does linear programming and mixed integer linear programming. I, I does not do uh, nonlinear, so mixed integer nonlinear programming. So it's kind of a pulp is kind of like a toolkit that is practical implementation of a lot of stuff you just showed. Exactly. Your present. Okay. Got it. Exactly. Okay. Cool. Um, so you would need to replace like path in and path out for your own if you for this code to you uh, will the repo where you put this. So we we basically are going to read the input to find the the inside temperature and the solar one, and we need to know the time step. And this is just the definition of a bunch of parameters, right? The economy. So the cost for operation, maybe a cost for comfort. Um, these are the building model parameters that we quite randomly fix. Um, and we can say that the set point is going to be constant over time. So it's a, it's not a dynamic set point because it doesn't change to keep things simple over a different time step. And our horizon is going to be the function of the shape of our problem right here. Um, so if I just, I'll, I'll run these uh, these couples of line right there just to get that, that defined. And then here uh, is the part where we define the problem. So we call pulp and... Oh, Visual Studio is a lot different than it used to be. I mean, it's not them. <laughs> it's not, I mean, it's not them. <laughs> so. Oh, no, no, okay, okay, okay. Right, anyway, we call, so as I mentioned before, when during the presentation, you call pop uh, to define my LP problem. You define the continuous variables for heat input, uh, building temperature, and the cost for comfort. So here you define a dictionary of actually pulp LP variables because there's different, there's a range of those values. You can lower bound them directly here by zero. I just do that for all of my, my defined variables. Um, and then here you would, you would input uh, your, your constraints. So here's the operational costs. Uh, that's basically, there's the sum of the, 
input uh, of heat times the cost for operation. And for every time step, your cost for comfort will be superior or equal to the difference between the set point uh, and the building's temperature multiplied by cost factor. You add the cost of the operation and the sum of the cost for comfort to their, to their LP problem, and that considers it the um, cost function, so the objective function. Excuse me, Julie, I missed this point. Uh, where is the connection with your model? What model? The building model? Yeah, the building model. Comes right after. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. No worries. Then you add your systems constraint. So this is the building model. Oh, okay. Exactly. So here I add to my LP problem the, 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 well, the equation I presented before. You upper bound, let's say, your, your heat input by a heat pump capacity that we defined in parameters earlier. So this is a parameter. And you define the initial conditions for your inside temperature of your building uh, to be a certain value. It could be, could be fixed by yourself, right? OK. Um, so let's run those. Um, and here we're going to, and here we solve the problem. So here we say, well, right, my LP dot solve, this is going to call or like the default solver, which is an atom solver for linear programming. Um, and we're going to try and converge to uh, and see if we get something out of it. It's implementing the problem and here it's running. So we can see whoop, right over here. So here it's, it's the, the problem is converging. So you get a bunch of outputs and you'd say, all right, nine rows, like we inverse the matrix, uh, we get primal infinity, and then we get the objective. Um, so this is just a bunch of outputs for debugging. All you need to check out is optimal. All right, we have optimal uh, solution has been found. Um, so that's great. The outputs that you could get here when you debug are, for instance, oh, um, infeasible. And feasible solution is typically the thing when you're just starting and you forgot to bound a variable. So it can go to minus infinity or plus infinity. So the problem is unbounded. Or you have a state space or like a couple of conditions that make your problem infeasible. So if I would, in this case, um, what would be infeasible here? Here would be infeasible if, um, let's say, instead of having a cost, um, well, this, this one's quite easy, but let's say if, if instead of having just attributing cost to this, uh, to the, the, the inside temperature of the building that must be uh, above the set point, uh, if I would make a hard constraint out of it, and I would say, actually, it's not allowed for the inside temperature of the building to be uh, below the set point, well, maybe then at, at one point it would be infeasible because maybe the heating capacity would limit my problem. And at some point, because the outside condition would be too cold, it's not possible. So then you get an infeasibility. So you have to look out for, for, for those when you, when you code. Um, we're visual, right? So let's, um, let's see the results that we've had. So here, this is just results extraction and we want to plot. And this is, well, you can write your file so you can watch them as the, as in the output that's produced. Uh, oh my god. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so this is the building inside temperature. This is the set point 20. We start with an initial value. And you can mm -hmm. see that here, the heat input is optimally controlled. So we perfectly stay on that set point temperature, awesome. um, because below that, we would have discomfort costs. Mm -hmm. And any overheat would be an additional cost, right? This is because this is math. Why at the end do we have a drop in inside temperature and we stop heating? Why? We're clearly saying this is going to cost us. We have discomfort cost here. So what's what's wrong? Uh, actually, the, the solver is just being smarter than us and saying, well, actually, for uh, by the end of the problem, it's OK for us to not heat it because the discomfort cost will be lower than the, actually the amount of heating that it will cost. But we'd be happy. So, so yeah, but that's, that's the objective function that you give your problem. So it's up to you to think, right? And you, you see the results, you're like, okay, it's behaving. That's what I'm telling it to do. And sometimes you think my objective function should work perfectly, but you get a behavior that's weird, but the solver is just being smarter than you are and saying, well, you asked me this, I'm minimizing it. This is what I get. <laughs> Right, so mm -hmm. so that's just an example here, and you can toy around with um, with these constraints. You could set a different set point or uh, a lower comfort cost, 
Uh, let's run this again, maybe here, let's say, let's say I make the comfort costs smaller than they were before. And if I run this again, then uh, let's see if how it behaves. So here we have what about, I think, how long is the data set? A couple of days, actually, it's like four or five days long. So it's not, it's not a very long problem to solve, so you get the results pretty quickly. Um, but typical sizing problems, if you want to optimize a district or a house and say, I want to size my battery, I want to size my heat pump, um, you're going to feed it a year of data, a typical year. And so that can take 20 minutes to run. Mm. to 40 an hour, depending on how you implement it. We can have a time true. So is it, is it kind of a sort of true statement that a lot of the, you have these massive supercomputers around the world, you know, a lot of the work they're doing is this is like optimization, but at a much more complex multi, yeah, like that. Yeah. That's the main point of having a massive supercomputer. Yeah. Is that a true statement? I mean, yeah, that is, or it's for modeling or like, yeah, things that are really heavy to run, but yeah, yeah. the CFD is, I think, uh, really known. I mean, right. the building right. part that, that takes a heavy amount. So here, same thing as before, but we can see that we have the decay to start smart earlier because the cost of the comfort is just too low. And so it's saying that. Not it's worth feeding anymore. Stops tearing up. <laughs> so you get this temperature decay. So our metal, our building model is all right. Okay. And so, yeah, that's it for the hands on part. And yeah, you have that here as a reference for you guys. Cool. I, I also thought I've implemented the distributed approach, but I uh, honestly did not have time anymore. <laughs> and I, I couldn't land, uh, yeah, get PV data or like a simple data set for this. But you can use the same data set and just approximate. Hmm. The the heat input of the solar to be this uh, this PV gains, for instance. Um, cool. Yeah. Any any other questions or comments or philosophical? We, we got a bit of time for a break, I guess. Um, anybody online have any anything to add or what's that? Time for copy or something. Time for a Kopi Oko song. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we've got, yeah, 15 minutes. That's perfect. Um, but, but I mean, before we do that, thanks, Julian. That was really cool. My brain is melting about 45% of the time because I was trying to, to capture some of the complexity, you know, complex tools that you were showing us. Um, but that's, that's great. So um, Next workshop, actually, Filippo, which we had scheduled for next week, but we will push to the week after. I'll make that announcement in the votes lab meeting. Uh, and then I think we have one more after that, which I think is the cozy workshop, right? Maybe a week after that, I believe. Uh, May, something like that. Anything else? Anybody, any other workshops? No, okay. Quick workshop. Ah, yes. Chuan Fu is giving a workshop. That's right. So we have we have three more in our first workshop series, our impromptu scheduled workshop series. Okay, cool. Thanks, guys. Let's take a quick break. So I'm gonna close and everybody that's online, I'm gonna close this meeting so that the the recording again for the button. So Thank <laughs> you.